I think one of the things that I first remember um, about uh, any kind of inspiration to get my parents' story told has had been the fact that my father had this number or six numbers tattooed on his uh, left inner forearm. Uh, they never spoke about it, um, or um, and it wasn't probably till we were in my teens that there was more and more said. My mother would talk about some of the things um, that happened to her while she was in a forced labor camp in the southern part of Germany. And I just became more and more intrigued about it. As I was trying to find more information, I found that there was very little, little written about what had happened to Polish uh, Holocaust survivors um, of World War II. Usually when you looked up uh, any information in any kind of book, you always found uh, information about the Holocaust that said uh, Jews and then uh, others. They may mention Roma, uh, Slavs, but they always put that into one, one group. And so I became more intrigued um, to get more information. It took me for a long, a long time to even begin to uh, get information. When I started um, my education here at IUPUC, I was um, in my late 40s, early 50s, I would think, late 40s. And um, again, I was able to, whatever information I was able to find, I was able to um, tried to tell their story through um, uh, some of the classes that I had taken, for instance, in sociology or communications history, especially in uh, English uh, in my writing classes. Uh, and that's where I was inspired to maybe begin to write their memoirs. And that was kind of difficult because my parents didn't talk about it much at all. It was almost as if they did not want to keep that as a burden to go on with life. Uh, they wanted um, to kind of put it past them. But I found just in some of the things that they did that um, it, there was still a lot caged inside of them and it wasn't until something was triggered. Um, for instance, uh, with my mother, um, when she came to live with me about 10 years ago, uh, we were watching a movie and it was The Pianist. It was about a Jewish, Polish pianist. And I knew she didn't like war movies, so I started to change it. And she said, no, no, we'll watch it. And she was fine up to the point where they were loading the Jews into the cattle cars. And then she, all of a sudden she said, stop, I don't want to watch it anymore. It was then that she told me when she was kidnapped off the streets of her city of Lublin, she was put on a wagon and then put on a train and then sent to the southern part of Germany as a forced laborer. I asked her just a couple of years ago what that train ride was like, and she said it was horrible. It was days long. It was one small window at the top of the, uh, the car, one bucket in the corner of the, uh, the car where they went to the bathroom, and, and then beyond that, then she just quit. Uh, again, and with my father, um, he, the, it would, I think he would open up a little more when he drank a little more. And he would tell me one story that was really um, striking and stayed with me. He was part of what was called the sewer underground in Warsaw. And that's where they, a lot of communications went through. A lot of the Germans didn't want to go down there because they considered it filthy. And he submerged from the sewer 
and the Gestapo what was waiting for him. Apparently someone had uh, betrayed him, turned him in, and he said he got out and then ran away to, um, to a building and then jumped on the roofs, um, like from roof to roof, something you would see perhaps in a movie. And, uh, but they finally caught him and then they sent him to the local po uh, Warsaw prison, War uh, Pavia prison, um, but that was a brutal, brutal place to be, and apparently I found out he was there for about eight months. From there, he was sent to Auschwitz, where he was tattooed. Um, he was also sent to Birkenau, just a couple of kilometers away from uh, Auschwitz, and sent to what was called the Penal Company, so he must have done something, and that put him in this block that you had to run everywhere. Uh, you were, um, whether to go to the bathroom, to go uh, to get something to eat, to uh, whatever work that they had, you made, uh, they made you do, um, uh, beaten, given much less food than n normal, and even then that was bad. Uh, so, uh, so it's little things like that, but also there was a story that he was sent to the gas chamber. I have to verify that. Um, but he had uh, an aversion to taking showers. He would take a bath, but no showers. So again, I will have to check with Auschwitz just how many poles were sent to the gas chamber and if there were any circumstances that um, maybe something happened and um, they, you know, they at that particular time, they couldn't go on. I don't know. I would imagine that there are a lot of documents might have been destroyed. They were. In fact, when I first notified Auschwitz, all they could give me was the date that he arrived, his um, tattooed number, and the date that he was sent to the next concentration camp, which was Mauthausen in Austria. And they said they couldn't give me any more information because the documentation was destroyed. And um, so there were many th little things in life um, growing up with them um, that something would come out. But it wasn't until I moved to the United States and on a couple of visits um, with my father, uh, he gave me a little more information. And then when my mother moved in with me, uh, I was able to pull out um, more information from her. And again, only uh, because something triggered her. Um, there was something that I found uh, in, in her possession, and this is um, a French, uh, it's a, a letter written by a French um, officer who she helped escape from the Gestapo. He was uh, in the same labor camp that she was in. And I was truly amazed at some of the things that she did. And uh, if I'm able to just read some of the, sure. what, this, this letter is obviously in French, and so I had to have it translated by a friend. Sure. So, um, but this is essentially what the letter says. It's I, the undersigned uh, Maurice, Nalbert Maurice, non-commissioned officer, it was in a war, um, declared that Kashmira Kamilska um, had strong feelings for the, uh, for the French, the people, and the customs. But I think she was uh, the type of person that helped almost anybody in that camp. That was her personality. Um, but it says here that she's been helping friends, fellow forced laborers at the barracks and labor camp who were working in the sawmill and for whom she used to help feed and prepare meals. Now that, which she told me she would steal food from the kitchen, snatch on the way to the um, sawmill, on, on the way back to, from the sawmill, she would snatch one of those free-ranging chickens and snap the ne uh, neck and put it in a bag and take it back. And apparently there was a cellar close to the kitchen where she would go down and uh, cook the chicken. 
I asked her one time what she, what she did with the feathers, and she goes, oh, that was interesting. There was a meat grinder, and she would put the feathers through the meat grinder. Wow. And then, then she would use the feathers as a means to put in the pockets to keep the hands warm when the weather got cold. <laughs> so uh, that was one of the things. But I also found out that there was a young German woman who worked in the kitchen who became my mother's best friend, she said. And I think this young German woman must have turned her head many times because my mother was able to come in, steal bread, meats, other foods as much as possible. Uh, in fact, my mother said there were a time or two she stole the bread right out of the oven, put it on her, hid it under her clothing till her skin burned. Um, so it, it, the things that she did were amazing also, but, um, but and so that's how she would find um, the food to give to others to help. Um, then the French officer put down, among other things, she would often sacrifice her food tickets to improve um, our daily meals. And I think that was because my mother thought there was nobody left um, to communicate with. And, and so she allowed everybody to use her tickets or any kind of mail service um, that was available to her. And again, he continues, the German control officer would come to search out stuff and she would take care of all the objects that we had better hide from them, taking many risks to do that. She would enable many of us to use her name and address in order to use a civilian mailing service. As far as I am concerned, she helped me in an unforgettable way, helping me escape by giving me civilian clothes and food supplies, uh, things that she had stolen to help others uh, for the journey. And the clothes that she had taken were then taken from the inmates of the camp and put into a storage area. And my mother would go in there and steal the clothing uh, that way. Finally, her most beautiful action to offer her home and her home was old mil military barracks housing for forced laborers. And in her case, it was a cramped room that she shared with eight other women, um, mostly Polish, but you know several of them from different nationalities. She offered the clothes, food, and other things for French prisoner women who had escaped and were chased after by the Gestapo. When she would be asked about these French women by the police, she would answer in a very smart way in order to divert, divert their suspicions. In doing so, she was taking a huge risk and she did in a real unselfish way, having nothing to gain from it. So it says in conclusion listed above are a few actions among thousands. Listing them would be too long. So I can only imagine what my mother did. I only have a smidgen compared to her couple of years in that camp. So that was um, my mother's story. But um, again, becoming involved with the French resistance movement with that camp. Uh, I often asked her why she did what she did. And she said, if not me, then who? And especially, um, she would wake up at, say, 3 in the morning with the stolen stash. And there was a forest nearby. And she would sneak out of the barracks, crouch by the end of, by the side of the forest, waiting for the French resistance movement to come to her. She'd give them the stuff. And then I'd merge back into the forest. And then she would run back to the camp. And I said, again, why? She would just shrug her shoulders. Wow. Yeah, so amazing. And my father, I knew he was in Auschwitz. I didn't realize he was in Birkenau. He was sent to Mauthausen, and, and the research that I have done on the concentration camps were just brutal, absolutely brutal. So he was there for, in Mauthausen, Austria, for uh, a couple of months then sent to uh, the only concentration camp in uh, France, and that was Natzweiler Stutthof. Uh, and then from there, he was sent to Schomburg, back in Germany. 
and that was at the tail end of the war. He then became part of the Dachau, well, the, the death march. They sent him to Dachau, and then right away they sent him on the death march. Um, and that's how my parents ended up being in the same part of Germany. Uh, they uh, met. Uh, my father was smitten terribly, my mother not so much. And um, six weeks later, she was, they were married. Um, she did not want to get married. She just wanted to enjoy the freedom a little bit. But my grandmother, when she finally was reunited with my grandmother, my grandmother loved this man because he played the mandolin, he played the violin. He came to visit my grandmother frequently and that's how my parents got married because my grandmother kind of pushed the button a little bit. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. I do have a funny story about my father in one of the camps. I don't know which one it was. He must have befriended a German soldier, for at least temporarily, who had two uh, large dogs, probably um, similar to German shepherds. So my father would feed the dogs and walk them and until the officer finally realized that the dog was getting thinner, the dogs were getting thinner. So uh, it was apparent that my father was stealing the food from the dogs. So it, those little stories that you don't hear, and that is why I want to be able to utilize what I learned at IUPUC, uh, especially in my writing classes, to be able to write down those memoirs. Uh, again, to be able to uh, tell the story uh, in some way. Uh, it, it's been amazing to me how many people do not know about the plight of the Poles and plight of so many other millions of people. And then I think I have a document here how many other people's, uh, people were affected, that there were tens of millions of people who died. And, and that's not including the people who survived the concentration camps and the other um, brutal ways of living, but uh, just the Ukrainians, up to seven million, uh, Russians, uh, uh, up to five million or more, Jews from all countries, six million, um, Poles, maybe three million, uh, Yugoslavians, tens of thousands of other people who, um, who suffered, and their stories need to be told. So how do you tell those stories? Uh, you need to be able to, especially in nowadays where uh, people maybe don't like to read as much and they prefer reading in shorter, um, shorter stories. And this is where perhaps the, a web polio blog would um, invite them to learn about this a little more. Uh, and so that's my goal. I did go to Auschwitz and Birkenau last year, uh, and some people have told me that they would never go back, but I think I would. In fact, I know I would, because there are just so many things I want to discover more about my parents, but also about other people who went through the same ordeal. And, and also to have people understand that how many um, Germans really didn't want to go through this. And so, you know, my intent is not to open up wounds, but to tell the story about everybody during the war. And as I mentioned earlier about the young German woman in, in, the, uh, in the camp that my mother was at, she obviously risked her life doing what she did. How many millions of others did that? How many millions of Poles took in Jews into their home and will never be given any kind of credit for it? Um, my mother and my grandmother hid a Jewish neighbor girl in their home for a while, but they couldn't keep her in there anymore. My grandmother uh, lost a son. In fact, she thought she lost another son to the war. She didn't know where one daughter was, and then she had my mother, the youngest, and, and she didn't, couldn't bear to lose her daughter. 
And so the, uh, that is one goal that I am going to do and through research that IUPUC has allowed me to uh, pursue is I was able through the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. I was able to get someone to direct me to a link where I can get uh, phone numbers from uh, 1939 through the war and I could maybe find out who that Jewish family was, who that young daughter, who the, their daughter was uh, that my mother and my grandmother tried to hide. So it's those type of stories that absolutely need to be told, how do I tell them? And in my mother's words, if not me, then who? So it's up to people like me, daughters, sons, granddaughters, grandsons, who are trying to preserve the history of the family to find some way to bring it to the surface. So that, uh, that's my goal and my mission. So sooner or later, now that I've graduated, I would like to begin uh, the memoirs That'll be a long process, but that's my intent. The reason I think it's important is, I guess maybe I, I thought after the, um, the crash of, of communism in, in Eastern Europe, uh, it seemed like uh, the world was going to open up. Uh, it would be a whole lot better. And there for a short time, uh, I believe there was some sort of harmony, maybe, if you would call it that. And then over the last, I've noticed in the last 10 years or more, how it, that's not what's happening, and how ancient hatreds still persist, and they never die. And so even though uh, we, we say we, we're all one family, it, it really isn't. Um, just amazing to me how how much is fed into the kids um, or not fed into the kids nowadays about what what happened and I don't think many realize how many evil people there are out there and all it takes is one Hitler one Stalin one anybody who can really convince people that you know hatred just needs to continue and that's not my goal you know it, it, when I was growing up my parents never ever said anything bad about the Russian people they didn't say anything bad about the Russian uh, the German people and that's what I grew up with. I, I didn't have that, that hatred. And nowadays, I'm, I'm just seeing how people just say, well, it's not happening to me. And so, you know, why? You know, what, what, what do I care? And, and for me, just to, I think one of the things that is a vital interest of me is that we have a lot of documentation um, from historians about facts and dates and uh, things like that, but you don't hear about the personal stories, um, the stories about my mother, what she did, um, how she was grinding chicken feathers to keep warm, uh, what my father did, stealing food from a dog to survive and, and how they managed to find a way to, uh, to live. And, and that was one of the things that I put down is, here I am, I, I'm graduating at age 71, and obviously I'm not going to go looking for a job. So my job now is to write, uh, write this story. And but I think it, it just, that, that's what's important for me, is just to get that bit of information 
uh, their education stopped at my mother 15, my, fa my father 20. And I, I didn't know a lot of this stuff when I was growing up. And the more information I find, it's just amazing how they used, how they survived, that was their education. So, uh, so I, I, I'm doing this to honor them, um, to leave a legacy, a written legacy for my family in particular, my children, my five children, and their children. But if anybody else is interested, that's what I want to learn. And then IUPUC and any kind of um, uh, help that they have given me is allowing me to, to spread that information out a little bit. And talking with people, even adults, they say, oh, I didn't know that. And, 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 and then cur encouraging me to make sure I do write something. Uh, because there is an interest. It's how it's presented. And maybe through the web folio, memoir writing is one way that can kind of draw people in to learn more about it. And, and that's that's you know what I think is important and, and f why it's important to keep this going. Yeah. Because it, it, it could happen. It's happening over and over again. We see that in the world right now. Being here in Columbus, living in Columbus, uh, it was uh, an opportunity for me to, to attempt going back to school. I have to tell you, I was intimidated to even try. But I have five children, and all of them graduated from IU, IU Bloomington. My husband is a native of Bloomington, and he went to IU uh, there also. I was the only one without a degree. Uh, my father, even though he was wanting to become an engineer and his family were uh, fairly well educated, he didn't think women should go to university. And so um, I think uh, my youngest son was still at IU in Bloomington when I went back to school. Well, maybe even earlier than that. I'm dating myself. But um, it was close. It was small. And you got an intimate um, classroom where you have maybe 15 people in there. You're able to have better interaction with each other, to, to share you know, what each of us had. I enjoyed being an older student because then I was able to have input in my life experiences and share it with the younger ones. And then the younger ones were able to share with me. So I liked that, that interaction. Um, and I, I think because Columbus was home. I couldn't really drive to Bloomington. I really couldn't drive to Indianapolis um, on a frequent basis, especially at my age when you're working and trying to raise a family and being a wife and all that fun stuff in the house, cleaning, gardening. <laughs> and so um, this was just an opportunity. and, and uh, just to be able to research uh, and given the guidance that I have and the support that I have from the, from the faculty uh, has been tremendous for me. So I think for me the environment of IUPUC was great because it was small. It was like a family, comfortable, and I only live seven minutes away, so that, that was another plus. But it, it, once I took that first class, it was a philosophy class, and I said to myself, I can do it. And then it's taken me many years, especially after my mother moved in with me and then having to be her provider. Uh, it, things got a little chaotic there for a while. but just to be able to realize that I can get the same education here as I can 
at IU Bloomington or Indianapolis um, because of the more intimate classrooms that I would think. Um, and you get more personal attention. Uh, and, and so I think um, a lot of students shouldn't feel like this is just a stepsister school and that it offers really as much um, curriculum. You may not have quite as many classes to offer as a larger um, campus would, but for the main core subjects, um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience for me. It really has. Again, I, I think that teachers have, have provided me or, or given me links uh, to, uh, to different resources. Um, and, and I'm sure there for the longest time, I perhaps didn't know what I was looking for until I, I decided, even though I got a general studies degree, uh, it wasn't like a, uh, in, like a total English degree or where you can focus on, on specific things. Um, but the resources, again, um, just being able to, what they have here at the library, um, particularly, I couldn't find a lot on, on my particular project. Uh, but then that's probably... Uh, that's create... That's it, because even when I went to the, uh, uh, the Bloomington Library, again, they did not have a lot of resources there. There is a Polish center at, at, um, uh, in Bloomington, and I was able to go there uh, and um, borrow a couple of books uh, from time to time. And so I consider IU Bloomington, IU PUC as, uh, again, sister campuses. And so what I couldn't find here, I tried to find in Bloomington. Uh, the books that I have here are through uh, Suggestions by other people on a couple of webs uh, on, a, on a couple of uh, Facebook pages that I belong to uh, that uh, are uh, for people like me who are trying to find inf more information, um, more about what happened to polls, and uh, so they've provided me with links. But uh, so I've incorporated the this with what. Uh, resources I could get here at IUPUC. Now that I know exactly what I want to do when I grow up, I, I, I will be able to maybe recommend to the library certain books, um, and that would uh, be uh, of interest to me. And also I have offered to come in and speak to um, any classroom, whether it's history or sociology or what, whatever classes that might find an interest in this, and I would be absolutely happy to uh, be um, a visitor, a frequent visitor perhaps, to, um, to come in and share what I have with the students here. Uh, and so I think if I'm able to do that on a smaller scope within this campus, then my story will be able to be spread out. Someone could say, I met someone who had this story, and someone from IUPUC that had this story, and, uh, and are willing to share it, or their point of view, sharing my point of view uh, into any conversations that they have with people uh, either now or down the road. The, the purpose of my research has been to really tell my parents' story um, because so many people are unaware and, and, and I think I mentioned it earlier, how do I tell it? And it's, I'm not going to say ignorance, 
because a lot of this stuff is not taught in high schools. I, in fact, I talked to someone just recently uh, who said he remembers being in high school and it was just maybe a day or two of covering World War II. So anything like this was insignificant. It wasn't important enough to tell. And so the goal is to just have, have people have an open mind about what happened. Um, and I think a lot of people may not like the history part of it, the facts, the dates, but I think a lot of people do have an interest in knowing about the personal things that happened to people during the war. Um, it, it's, uh, they tend to, I think, relate to that um, because over the years I've talked to people who said, I really didn't like history, I don't like the dates and, and the generals and the other people and they, they have no relevance to me. But I think they can relate to um, something personal happening to, uh, to someone. And so that's, that, I think, is my goal, is just essentially um, go out and say there was more to, the, there are millions of more stories in war than what you see in history books. And those are, it, just in my family alone, it, my, you know, my mother's side, my father's side, both of them are from two different cities. And yet, when I think of the stories just with my mother and father, how many millions of other stories, personal things, how people met, how people survived, what they did, did they collaborate, did they not collaborate, what would you do if you were faced with a situation where you were to save someone else versus your, versus your own family member? And that's the way I look at it. What would you do? And, and that's, I think, what we are faced with, whether it's war or not. If you were looking at the prospect of saving somebody else's life versus your daughter's life, how would you handle it? How, now, how could you live up, as in this circumstance, the young girl, Jewish girl, who is living up, living with my grandmother and grandmother, grandmother and mother, versus saving my mother, her youngest daughter? What would you do? And that's what I want people to become aware of, is that we, we are faced with situations. Sometimes we think, I would never do that. I could, I could never tell on somebody. I could never turn someone in. But if it means your life, your family's life, I think most people would choose their family. Because when my parents, at the end of the war, they were left with nothing, absolutely nothing. The few photographs that I have are very few. I would say less than two dozen, less than two dozen family pictures. They had no furniture, they had nothing. And yet they were able to carry on and survive. And when my grandfather died of uh, typhus, uh, typhus or typhoid fever, I'm not certain, in 1942, this is my father's father. My grandmother, my mother's mother had one of the two. I can never differentiate between either one of them. But she could have died too. You know, it's those little things that um, I think are so meaningful in, in, on how you, how you look at the world. And you cannot convince me to say I would never do that because if I'm faced with a situation of saving my kids, say, versus you, beg your pardon, I think I'd pick my kids, you know? I, I mean, I'd do my best, just like my mother did her best in saving all those, all those women, the French officer.
what would you do? You don't know. You could probably try to do both. And I think most people do try to do that. A push comes to pull, what do you do?